the software engineering quality course in, in winter. And uh, I've been uh, out with some medical stuff, so I haven't thought about this too much, and I haven't thought about what I'm going to do in winter, so I came in early while you were canoeing and made a few notes. But if you need more or want more, just uh, let me know. So if Dan made a pitch at the end that, that the things you're going to do while you're pushing are going to bring symbols connect to real software, and I'm going to, uh, in some sense, focus on the same kind of idea, which is all of you have built at least some software. And does anybody have any comments on, on what they found, what you found difficult or annoying about building it or changing it? Or changing somebody else's? You've never thought about this and you're here in grad school. What sucks about writing software? Bugs. Bugs? Yeah. And how do those happen? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, trying to write something in a way such that it would be easy for me to like I don't know, change it easily later. Yeah, or somebody else did. Yeah. 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 Is that an external interface or API so that you to use with other software and interact with other software? Oh, so the interactions among the different APIs and so forth are increasingly complex. I mean, when I went to undergrad and grad school before Dan was born, um, uh, you know, we basically built things mostly from scratch with a little bit of libraries. And now that's not true. We build it with a tremendous amount of uh, infrastructure out there, which has some very good things and a few bad things about it. More? Yeah? Working with somebody with a bunch of other people's code that's really big and hard to navigate and yeah. So, so, I mean, the bad news is to build complex systems that we care about usually take more than one person. There are some exceptions for sure, but most big systems require more than one person. I have some kind of slide for my undergraduate class that if you, I can't remember, if you sat down and you uh, just typed Windows 7 or something like that, didn't think, didn't go to the bathroom, didn't eat, didn't do anything, it would take you, I don't know, 25 years just to type it, you know. So it, th these are big systems, and that means they can be hard to understand, and you know, part of it, and then there are all sorts of issues ranging from personality, but also the technical ones that are there. The point is that software, in some sense, doesn't seem like it should be so hard, but there are lots of these things that come up in practice that make it more difficult. And what I'd like to try and do in um, 503 is, in some sense, uh, look at these problems and look at them at an arc that takes us from some of the foundational old work to some of the modern techniques for using software development. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, you know, the uh, 30, 35 years ago, basically, when we came to a program and wanted to decompose it, we used techniques like functional decomposition, information hiding, and, and, and so forth, which gives you a particular modular structure. And it has, they have advantages and disadvantages. But there are lots more. I mean, Dan didn't talk too much about module systems, but they're the higher order module systems. But there are also things like aspect-oriented programming, which say you think about these things in different ways. And why? What does it give you? What, what, what's different? Uh, uh, what's going to change? How do you handle these kinds of things? And we'll try and look at that again uh, from a historical to a modern perspective to see not only where we might be, what, but what some of the problems are, but also why we're there. And it does fit into some of the reasoning techniques and, and things that, that Dan mentioned, too. Uh, another simple example is, you know, historically we used a lot of very simple control structures. Uh, after the go-to, you know, while loops and if then else loops, structured control, uh, and there are a lot of advantages to that. But now we've gone to event-based and aspect-oriented, lots of different kinds of mechanisms for managing flow of control, and this this really gives us a lot more flexibility. Helps it e to make it easier to change, to build groups and different kinds of structures. At the same time, these control structures make it harder for people to understand the actual and potential behaviors of the software. And remember, the software is never what we care about. It's the executions of the software that we care about, right? They're the things that do something in our world. Uh, we hope not launch missiles and so forth, but they do something in our world. So it's the behaviors, and the software is an indirect way for us to describe the behaviors we want, and that's really hard. <clears throat> the problem with a lot of the modern 
control constructs, like events and so forth, is that while it makes it easier to change the system, it makes it much harder to understand the control flow of the system. How did I get here? Oh, I can't have gotten here. This is not possible. Well, except for it did. Right? And there are a lot of modern techniques for reasoning and, and helping with that understanding, but it's hard. Uh, one last example is uh, historically testing and verification have been really separate. Uh, there were really strong technical distinctions, testing being a dynamic thing you, you run against the program, and uh, verification being a static uh, process that you do to, to basically prove a property across all executions. And again, technical distinctions, but as much cultural distinctions. Go, you know, Dan and I can take you out for beer and tell you about some of that historically. What's really, I think, exciting about that uh, is, is that that's really no longer so true. There have been advances in model checking, in symbolic execution, and a set of related techniques that sort of blur some of these distinctions. There are techniques that use some dynamic and some static and interlace uh, them in, in, in really powerful ways. And I think that that's just a tremendous opportunity. We'll talk about a set of the techniques that, that enable uh, a set of that. In terms of the structure, I'm not as well thought out as Dan. There will be some standard kinds of assignments with very few Greek letters, if any. And what I've usually done at the end, and I'm, I'm open-minded if people have other ideas, but is a project uh, that's negotiated between individuals or small teams in me that is pertinent to the course and is of interest to the person or people in, in the group, I want to know more about this, or, or I want to try and apply this technique to this system. And there could be lots of other stuff. And they, they have led to things like workshop papers and a few things like that. So, uh, and again, the structure may, may, may change, but it's pretty much like that. On a separate note, before I finish and ask if you have questions, um, I was supposed to show up yesterday, and at some point I was on early schedule. Uh, for whatever reason, having been graduate program coordinator or, or chair or whatever, uh, it is not uncommon for students to end up being referred to me if they're having uh, some difficulty with an advisor, with a situation in a group, with anything. And people should be more than uh, feel very comfortable sending me email or stopping by my office if, if you have something you want to chat about it sometimes. Uh, Occasionally, I can help or at least tell you that it's not all in your head, and plus it happens to me. So. Okay, any questions about 503? And there isn't one on Coursera that I know of. Okay, Dan.